Hello, everyone, and welcome to what promises to be another exciting and educational episode of the AABIP podcast. This is your host and podcast editor, Udit Chada. And on this podcast, it is my honor to introduce to all of you our new associate podcast editor, Abhinav Agrawal. Our topic for today is bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, and our guest is arguably the global leading authority on this topic. topic. Dr. Gerard Kreiner is the chair and professor of thoracic medicine and surgery at Temple University. Dr. Kreiner, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. Thanks for asking me. Uh, before we get started, do you have any relevant conflicts of interest to disclose? I was the principal investigator for the pivotal trials for both uh, Pulmonix, the Liberate study, as well as for Spiration Olympus with the Improved study. And I've um, received uh, consulting and travel funds for both Olympus and Pulmonix for presentations and educational seminars. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, all right, with that, let's get started. Thank you, Odil, for the kind introduction, and welcome, Dr. Kreiner. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to talk about bronchoscopic lung volume reduction today, and let me just start off with a brief introduction. Patient selection for lung volume reduction surgery, as we know, is limited due to a high post-operative, non-fatal pulmonary complications, and also a short-term mortality of 7.9% at, at the 90-day mark. This is particularly relevant in patients with a low FEV1 of less than 20%, and homogeneous emphysema, or DLCO, less than 20%. The surgical intervention is also largely limited, as we know, to being performed at centers of excellence in which the surgery could be performed, as in those that were part of the NET trial. Bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, or BLVR, first described in 2003, has now evolved to encompass various techniques aimed at causing targeted lobe collapse through endobronchial valves or coils, or by bypassing abnormal airways with stents, or inducing a targeted lobe destruction and remodeling through sealants or thermal vapor ablation. These techniques, unfortunately, have had a variable success and require larger and more robust studies before their widespread use can be recommended. Though we know that within the last two years, two endobronchial valves, the Zephyr endobronchial valve and the Spiration intrabronchial valve, have obtained FDA approval after multiple studies for BLVR. So, Dr. Kreiner, I would want to start off by asking you, what patients should we be considering for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction using these endobronchial valves? Yeah, good, very good question. Um, overall, it's patients that have been maximized on optimal medical therapy and continue to be breathless and have emphysema as a major phenotype of their disease and um, have evidence of complete fissures or um, fissure assessment by physiologic technique with endoscopy, showing that they have no evidence of collateral ventilation. Those people that have those features could be considered for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction with an endobronchial valve. Some of the physiologic parameters that go along with that are patients that have really gold three to gold four severity of airflow obstruction with FEV1s between 15 to 45 percent of predicted and have residual volumes that are at least 150% of predicted and higher if patients have homogeneous disease. The only prospective randomized control trial that was done with bronchoscopic um, uh, lung volume reduction using an endobronchial valve was the IMPACT trial. And those patients had a um, floor of entry criteria of an RV of 200% of predicted. One should know that in the pivotal trials itself, the uh, mean FE, uh, residual volumes were 225% of predicted or greater in, in the LIBERATE study and more than 250% of predicted in the IMPACT study. So the degrees of hyperinflation in the trials themselves are usually higher, the mean data, compared to what was seen as far as entry criteria. Then six-minute walk distance being in the swath of patients, 100 uh, meters uh, for a threshold up to 500 meters, as a ceiling overall, those are the general ranges of patients that are too sick or too well to be considered for an, an intervention, even though it's minimally invasive, and then not being active smokers for at least four months overall. And I think one of the things to consider overall when you consider any type of lung volume reduction procedure, whether it's surgery or a bronchoscopic approach, regardless of um, method, is that this type of intervention does not significantly improve gas exchange. Overall, the mean improvements in PaO2 are about two to three torr, 
and it mean reductions in PCO2 or two to three TOR. So these procedures should not be used to get patients off supplemental oxygen or decrease severe or moderately severe hypercapnia overall. So it's an adjunctive treatment in patients optimally medically treated to decrease significant air trapping that's due to emphysema. And in a case of an endobronchial valve, these patients must have structurally intact or physiologically intact fissures to work correctly. Thank you so much for summarizing that uh, so well. We know that for patients who have a fissure completeness score of 80 to 95%, an intraprocedural confirmation of the absence of collateral ventilation can be done using charters. Dr. Kreiner, what do you do for those patients who have a fissure completeness score of less than 80%? And a second part to that question is, what about those patients who have a fissure completeness score using this modality of greater than 95%? Do you automatically select these patients for a valve placement? Yeah, great question. So overall, this becomes a very important sort of feature of selection for patients uh, to consider for endobronchial valve treatment. And I think it's important to step back for a step second and realize what we're looking at with CAT scans looking for structural integrity of the fissure versus physiologic intactness of the fissure uh, by using the chartus. So overall, with looking at... Um, the computer programs that are being generated, those are reports, but really the inspection of fissure completeness is done qualitatively. There's no automatic computational assessment of fissure integrity that occurs at this time. This is done by labs, by qualitative assessment overall, by the vendors that are subcontracted by the companies to look at fissure completeness. So your own eye or your thoracic radiologist eye can help you to complement that. The physiologic uh, in, intactness of the fissure by the chartist is looking at flow across the fissure that you're looking at to treat the patient at the time of assessment. And they're really somewhat similar, but somewhat dissimilar in that one's structural integrity versus physiologic integrity. So you can really in, um, logically conclude from that, some patients may not have a, a, a fissure that's structurally intact, but could be physiologically intact or vice versa that could be present. So what this means from the literature is that if you have a fissure that's less than 80% complete, the likelihood of physiologically uh, intactness of that fissure is less than 15%. If you have a fissure that's 95% structurally intact by looking at an HRCT, the likelihood of that being physiologically intact is going to be 15%. So you have like some indication of a correlation of both of these measures for patients that are very open um, by fissure intactness by looking at HRCT and very complete on the opposite end overall, but they're not always the same. The best patients to treat are patients that have complete fissure shown by HRCT and physiologically intact as shown by the chartist those patients are much more likely to be intact overall. And if you fail with getting volume reduction in those cases, it's related to improper selection or placement of the valve or patients that overall have um, problems with pleural adhesions that you can't see by HRCT that's not letting the lobe come down overall. So you have a good sense of knowing that those lobes should come down with uh, in, uh, proper uh, valve placement and if they don't have any pleural adhesions. This group in between 80 to 95% are more problematic. Those patients should not have valves placed by themselves with fissure intactness by itself, at least greater than 90% in those cases. In those who are between 80 to 90%, they really need to have a collateral ventilation assessed by a chartist physiologic assessment. If they don't exist, the likelihood of treatment effect in those cases is less than 30% overall. So I think this gives us some clue, but one should acknowledge that these data actually are limited in, in amount overall. These are studies that have looked at retrospective performance of chartist assessment, mainly in patients that had an HRCT in four clinical trials. So I think we need much more data to show exactly the fidelity of either treatment in those cases. Thank you so much for summarizing that. So to your point, the patients with both structural integrity of the fissure and physiological integrity would be the best candidates. Yeah. Perfect. 
in the patients in the impact trial, as we had talked about homogeneous emphysema, and some in the Stelvio trial had homogeneous emphysema, which was defined as less than 15% difference in emphysema destruction scores between the target and the ipsilateral lobes. So can you explain how you go about selecting these patients with homogeneous emphysema for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction? And what is your opinion on the role of the perfusion scan? Yeah, that's also a very good question overall. And, and as you um, gave in the uh, kind of like introduction to this question, the amount of data that we have for bronchoscopic lung reduction effects in patients with homogeneous disease is minimal in number and short on scope for duration of effect. So you remember from the lung volume reduction surgery, the NET trial, we had data that went out to seven years for these patients overall, physiologic assessment and clinic, important pivotal clinical outcomes. Right. The IMPACT study was a three-month study. An Estelvio study was a six-month study. And in the IMPACT study, it was only 50 patients. And I think of the 60 patients in the Estelvio study, only 15 were homogeneous disease. So the numbers of patients from these two pooled studies is low in number, and shortened duration overall. That being by it said, there is significant clinical improvements that you can demonstrate the endpoint of those studies in improving FEV1 overall. Now, how durable is it and how, um, uh, how um, great magnitude is the benefit overall? Well, if you look from any form of a lung reduction procedure, whether that's surgery or bronchoscopic, whether it's valve or steam or coil or glue, the magnitude and the duration of the improvement of the decrease in air trapping is not as robust as it, what you see with heterogeneous disease. And it's somewhat, it can't be a logical conclusion because patients with homogeneous disease don't really have any significant less impaired tissue, whereas patients with homogeneous disease have diffuse disease overall. So I think one of the important things when you discuss a lung reduction procedure in patients with homogeneous disease is you tell them that the degree of improvement and the magnitude of the improvement that they may see may be limited overall compared to patients with heterogeneous disease, but may be better than just optimal medical treatment by itself. To, in this patient group, it's very important to choose the lobe that's most um, affected by the disease and the patient that's most affected by hyperinflation. So it's very key in this patient population, homogeneous disease, even more than heterogeneous, the patients that are most uh, hyperinflated by itself or more likely to respond, and that the lobe that should be targeted for treatment for the be the one that's most <clears throat> impaired by a lack of perfusion. If the perfusion is more tw than 20% less than the other lobes, and the patient is very hyperinflated, as I told you before in the impact study, those patients had a mean um, RV 250% of predicted or greater, those patients are more likely to see a clinical benefit that's going to be meaningful as well as going to be um, more durable. So I think it's the key is to look at perfusion less than 20% in the lobe and a patient group that's really affected by hyperinflation for it to be a successful intervention. Dr. Kreiner, do you use the SPECT CT scan at all? Yes, I think, you know, not everybody has a SPECT CT to use. Some patients will, uh, some providers will just have a plain RCT to use. And that can give you a clue as to how the patient will do. That's what we had in the NET trial overall. And that showed really robust results in using the, the perfusion scan overlay with the CT scan to show what patient's um, magnitude and duration of treatment will be. But if you have a SPEC uh, CT to use uh, or nuclear medicine scan to use, which is the overlay of a low-dose CT scan, a tidal ventilation with perfusion data, that can give you a fidelity down to the low bar level. And that ends up being important for those middle zones of the lung where you don't know if it's part of the upper lobe or the superior segment of the lower lobes and can tell, or the middle lobe overall on the right side to be able to tell you what is the most oligemic load to check. So I would recommend if you have a SPEC CT, use it. If you don't, then you can still use a plain R nuclear medicine scan, but you need to keep in the back of your mind what is the middle lobe versus the superior segment or the lingula versus the superior segment on the left side? Thank you so much for that. So moving on to how I should be following these patients or we should be following these patients. Let's say I have a patient who is CV negative and we placed endobronchial valves and we have seen no reduction in the target lobe during the three days of hospitalization. 
uh, discharge him or her for outpatient follow-up, how long should I be waiting before I call this a failure? And in case these patients do not achieve a target low reduction, what is your approach? Do you get a CT scan? Do you rebronch them to make sure that the valves have not moved? And when would you consider removing valves and call, calling them uh, endobronchial valve failure? Yeah, that's actually a question that we did not address into the clinical trials, but in clinical practice is a terrific question. So you can tell the patient what the next steps will be. So we just um, constructed an abstract and submitted to the ATS. The ATS that actually did not happen uh, was looking at the time point or the temporal change in looking at uh, low bar volume reduction by uh, chest x-rays that we get daily in our patients overall and measured the amount of volume reduction. And what we reported is that if you don't usually have it by four days, you're likely not going to get it, um, except for rare circumstances at six weeks or 45 days. You can in about 15% of subjects, but in 80 to 85% of subjects, most of what you're going to see for volume reduction, you're going to see within the first 96 hours. And that tends to make sense because that's the height of the time where patients develop a um, pneumothorax, which is really related to re uh, or really related to expansion above which the non-targeted ipsilateral lobe can handle in terms of volume shifts overall. So that tends to make physiologic sense overall. But in some cases, 15 to percent of the cases, about thereabouts, the valves will settle over time and you might get further lung reduction. So what we wait is day 45, or about six weeks after the valves are placed. So we can basically see how much targeted lobe reduction that they have. And if they don't have targeted lobe reduction, it's probably related to one of two factors. One is that the valves are not placed properly or the valves may have shifted or moved over time. And also if the patient has pleural adhesions that you didn't see before, like I mentioned, that even with proper valve placement, the other thing is we wait that long because with valve um, or with low bar shifts over time, there might be some valve movement in terms of not only proximal movement, but might be related to valve rotation. It may let um, some of uh, sub-segments that are really at the area where the valve was placed become not a pacified and really lead to re-expansion of the lobe. So we wait to a period of time to valve settle overall, and then decide if we need to replace a valve. How often do we do that? That's about 15% of patients overall do we see valve rotation, and then we need to do replacement. And what do we do for replacement over time, at that time? Well, we might uh, choose, depending on what the nature of the valve change is, to go more distal and place more valves, or we might place a different type of valve, especially if there's granulation tissue that might have developed they actually have pushed the valve and rotated the valve out of time. So at the point of contact with the airway wall is a little bit different. So Dr. Kreiner, you mentioned the pneumothorax and for our audience, you know, usually due to ipsilateral non-targeted lobe expansion, it can occur in these patients with a rate of as high as up to 30%. In the studies, it was anywhere between 2.1 to 33.2%. Dr. Kreiner, are you seeing such high rates of pneumothorax in your patient population? Yeah, we've treated about um, 225 patients with endobronchial valves since commercial approach, uh, approval at Temple. And, you know, we tell patients that it's going to happen. You know, we give them about one in three patients is going to be the quote overall. And we'll see about 20 to 30 percent of the our patient cohort. I think it's the last that we looked at it and analyzed it was about 26.6 percent of the patient population. And we'll see runs of where we'll see no pneumothorax. And in the last four patients I placed, I had three out of the four patients that developed a pneumothorax overall. So I think it's, you know, in a specific patient overall, that's what one of the challenges is, is being able to predict for that individual patient what their risk of pneumothorax is. And I think the complication is it's, it's really not well defined as yet. Is it related to the degree of volume shift? We tend to see that the patients that have greater success in volume reduction, that those patients have a greater likelihood of a pneumothorax developing in people with less volume uh, change. So patients that have 1.7 liter reduction in residual volume, we see a greater risk of pneumothorax than those with a 700 to 800 ml of, of uh, uh, RV reduction overall. Uh, but tissue integrity, 
The rate of change that depends upon elastic recoil of the lung, which you can't really measure, is probably a factor. And also the number and the degree of adhesions that patients have. So, you know, overall, it, it, it ends up being a range overall. But what we tell patients is that pneumothorax is a necessary consequence of effective treatment and that we prepare every patient to develop a pneumothorax. And at every point in time, we have a patient that is uh, in a location that's prepared to recognize and treat a pneumothorax. So we do imaging four times in the first day that we do um, a valve placement and then daily thereafter. All the patients are followed with a chest tube cart that's based for needle decompression down to a pigtail that can be placed or an open thoracotomy at the time of the procedure. And as we uh, modify the protocol in the Liberate study, if a patient has more than 50% volume reduction estimated by chest x-ray within the first 24 hours, they get an HRCT to look for early findings of a pneumothorax overall that may be amenable to tube placement overall. So it's a high surveillance, a high threshold that we have for the detection of a pneumothorax and early treatment of that. Thank you so much. That is very helpful in terms of having an informed discussion with our patients and for patient safety. For most BLVR studies, the Zephyr and the bronchial valves were used. Uh, for the, but the aspiration into bronchial valves were used in the IMPROVE, REACH, and IBV trials. The aspiration valves have a size 5, 6, and 7, and 9 millimeter, while the Zephyr has a 4 size 4 EBV, which covers the airway diameters from 4 to 7 millimeters, and a size 5.5 EBV, which covers the airway diameters from 5.5 to 8.5 millimeters, both in the regular and the shorter lengths, which is also known as the LP. So Dr. Kreiner, do you have a valve of preference between two? And I know this could be a leading question. And is there any specific characteristic of one valve versus the other that you personally like? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. And, you know, being a investigator in both studies overall, I know both products very well, and I feel very comfortable in using them for any patient overall. Um, one of the Im important um, issues to try to answer this question is, is there any head-to-head -head studies that look at one valve versus the other one in terms of um, ease of or success of placement and patient outcomes? And the short answer to that is no, there is not overall, and I doubt that there will ever be, for the reason that there really is rarely any head-to-head -head comparisons of looking at commercially approved products, whether it's an inhaler or whether it's any type of device, including a valve. So I don't think we'll ever see that overall. That being said, uh, you know, you've outlined what the valve ranges are, but, you know, the airway walls also change. And if you go more distally, you can put a valve in any location that you want because obviously the airway size uh, will be smaller and will accommodate any valve dimension. The more difficult issue is, <clears throat> will the valve be optimally placed based on what the nature of the valve is? So you know that the Zephyr valve is one that fits best when it's placed on a carina, so there's not distal movement because there's not distal anchoring. And that serves best when you can actually see that distal carina and you could do a partial deployment and place that valve and you know the valve isn't going to move any further. Compare that to the spiration valve, which has distal anchors overall that you can place that. Now, one of the challenges is, is when you have more angulated valves where you can't see the distal carina. Where a spiration valve, you don't, since it has distal feet that can um, anchor the valve, you don't need to place it on the carina. However, it's more difficult to angulate the spiration valve system into an area where it's a around the corner bend that you can't see overall, and it may not allow you to place the valve. There's some special techniques that you can use, such as breath hold, head rotation, um, do it at residual volume, pull the endotracheal tube back to allow to get that degree of flexion that may allow you to accommodate. But with the, spar uh, with the Zephyr valve system, you actually have some J catheters that can allow you to make the bend and do the deployment. So as you can see from what I'm saying, there's pluses and minuses from both devices overall. that may be better in one circumstance than the other one, or when patients, like I mentioned before, have one valve placed that they um, have an optimal placement that might be related to granulation tissue, 
then I treat the granulation tissue and I place the opposite valve mainly to see if that will mitigate against further granulation tissue development. But overall, I think that both valves could work in almost any circumstance and there's some nuances that make, make, make one a better option than the other one, but really it's not ever been shown by any evidence-based medicine. <clears throat> I think one of the things are, these are two great products that have just been FDA approved. Both, both of them could have further modifications to improve their efficacy overall in that 15 to 20% of patients that have rotation of valves or movement of valves uh, to make sure that that's not the case and we get more durable um, effectiveness over time. So on that thought, do you have any experience or comments about you know, what advantages some other non-valve-based technologies to achieve this lung volume reduction may provide? So all of the time that was spent talking so far has been on people, uh, patients that can meet the criteria of no evidence of collateral ventilation, whether it's fissure integrity or a lack of collateral ventilation measured physiologically. That's 30% of the population. 70% right. of the population with patients with severe hyperinflation from emphysema were not able to treat right now. But these other technologies that have been studied, none of them um, FDA approved in the United States, none of them uh, undergoing current study in the United States could address this uh, problem, such as uh, use of lung coils, which are part of a phase two trial now being done in Europe right now, but not, um, not uh, approved for use of clinically uh, by the FDA in the U.S. and not undergoing clinical trial in the uh, U.S. Um, uh, thermal ablation, which is approved in some parts of the world uh, for treatment of lung reduction, uh, could be a viable option because not only is it effective in CV positive or non-fissure intact patients, but also since it's slower over time, it has a less uh, uh, rate uh, incidence of pneumothorax overall. Um, same thing for biologic lung volume reduction, its rate of pneumothorax is low and a flowable technology may allow us to get those more difficult to angulate apical segments of the, the upper lobe or the lower lobe. And both of them could be used to treat on a segmental, not a low bar fashion. So we could sculpt around the heterogeneity of emphyseminous involvement at the low bar level, which we can't achieve with the endobronchial valve treatment. And then um, finally, I think one of the things that is done in Europe, but not so much in the United States, is using uh, lung reduction uh, to sculpt lobes at a low bar level. That's done by Walter Vader um, very well in, in, uh, in Switzerland, but not many have adopted that technology outside of the U.S., so I think there's a wide range of bronchoscopic technology that needs to be developed uh, using the bronchoscope <laughs> to address this issue of collateral ventilation patients that we haven't really tapped in, into yet. And we need to do a lot of work to push that to get that approved in the U.S. and do the research that needs to be done. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you'll be leading some of those trials. Do you envision any of them coming to the United States soon, or we still have a lot of work from that perspective? Well, we still have a lot of work. We're pushing pretty hard to get this done. We're looking for some of the trials to be done in the U.S., at least as um, an early study overall because of the high unmet need that occurs. And some of these options, as you well know, really <clears throat> patients with diffuse disease who have collateral or heterogeneous disease or collateral ventilation positive who aren't candidates for uh, lung transplantation is really an extreme unmet need at this time. Thank you so much. This has been great, and I'm sure this will be very helpful for our listeners and as informative as it has been for us. Any closing comments, Dr. Kreiner? No, um, it's a dynamic field. It's I think uh, one thing is bronchoscopic lung reduction is really the thing that I think will drive to the forefront the, um, the advantages that interventional pulmonology brings to therapeutic applications for patients with a variety of lung diseases, not only asthma, but now emphysema and different forms of emphysema, and hopefully uh, chronic bronchitis and lung cancer treatment in the, fu in the future. Thank right. you so much, Dr. Kreiner. This has been fantastic. We've thoroughly enjoyed hosting this. Uh, thanks for the privilege Absolutely. of presenting. Talk to you guys later. Yeah. Thank and you. Thank you for listening to this episode. Please do subscribe to the AABIP YouTube channel where you can listen to this podcast and view other educational material created by the AABIP for free. Thank you.